Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for those great presentations. Um, so we're, we're going to start up with our Q&A speakers to talk. Perhaps I'll, I'll start us off with those questions and, um, and then uh, maybe add in some more. And I'll encourage folks, keep adding in your questions to the Q&A box because we do have some, some great time with our speakers. Um, the first question that I have, and I, this was a question asked by Amy, and I think, Claire, that this came up in the context of your presentation. So perhaps I'll, I'll steer this one to you. Um, and that was asking whether um, the site that you're working with with Sprott is a dry site or if it's accessible to youth who are also drug users. Presentations. Um, so we're, we're going to start up with our Q&A. Mm -hmm. There might be a funny thing. You just have to hide the, the stream that's coming up on the other video. Oh, hide the stream. Okay, yeah. sorry, one second. Sorry. Okay, got it. There we go. And we're back. <laughs> um, Sprout House is uh, at, at the YS YMCA youth programs. We operate as harm reduction um, sites. So um, we do not just like we, we have, we, I should speak that, shouldn't I? Come on, that's awesome. <laughs> we operate with harm reduction principles. So um, while we don't allow folks to use um, in, in, out, out in the house, generally, um, if they do have alcohol or uh, substances, um, we talk to them about that so that they are using safely. And we have all the kits and all the materials uh, necessary um, to help them practice safely. And we have YSAP, which is the YMCA Youth Substance Use Program counselors. Uh, to support them with their use uh, as, as necessary. Thanks so much, Claire. And I have another question that I, I also think Claire was directed at you, but maybe I'll, I'll steer it at you and, and also ask Alex, Alex and Francesca to maybe speak to this more, more broadly as well. Um, and the specific question voiced by Lindsay is what is the follow-up for youth whom exit the program? And is there any follow-up? Um, so maybe I'll, I'll steer that towards you, Claire, and if folks doesn't um, apply, um, just thinking a little bit through the importance of, of follow-up after and reflecting a bit on that concept. It depends on the program that they, they move on to. Um, if they've gone on to a YMCA Units for Youth program, there is a, a follow-up worker, a one-year case management that they um, have to work with. Um, if they're through the rapid rehousing program through the city of Toronto um, or through the um, housing subsidies, the THAP housing subsidies, follow-up workers are available. If it's rapid rehousing, that specific program through um, the city of Toronto, then the follow-up uh, case management is required. Um, we do provide um, some follow-up uh, with participants who move out for several months after if they reach out to staff and they need help with paperwork. Um, they have questions, they just want to check in, that kind of thing. But our on-site supports are where our focus has to be. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to, to go next. Um, so basically, I could I have a different perspective. Obviously, from research perspective, it's something that um, has been an ongoing challenge, uh, you know, in many projects. Um, to continue that follow-up uh, after a person might graduate or um, uh, leave a program. And, um, you know, from a research perspective, it's definitely difficult to maintain that contact because oftentimes participants may, uh, you know, they may lose interest in the research project, they just might want to move on with their lives and might, you know, being part of the project might remind them of a time where they were in crisis or there's so many different factors and I think that it's really on an individual sort of basis, but I do think that it is very important in terms of conducting ongoing evaluations of, of these types of population based housing programs which we have so few programs uh, of this type, uh, first of all across Canada. And second of all, there are so few evaluations of transitional and supportive housing programs. And so I think that, you know, a key element really is to continue to follow up with young people as they move out of the program to truly understand how has their lives changed and where are they living now and what sorts of supports might they continue to need. 
And so that is something that um, that my team, you know, we integrate definitely, you know, in, into our projects as we evaluate programs and as we discuss with uh, the inclusion program, um, you know, longitudinal evaluation. That would be a key component as well. Thank you, Alex. I'll take a, a, a stab at it as well. Uh, thank you for the segue. Yeah, we're still quite early in terms of our program, but it is um, uh, a very important consideration on our end in terms of uh, what happens with follow up and uh, when youth move out into housing. At Blue Door, we do have aftercare workers that uh, take on that function. And one of the things that we're looking at uh, for the inclusion program, as Alex mentioned too, in terms of the long term, is including that aftercare element uh, for the inclusion program too. Um, the other piece, I think it's slightly unrelated, and I think uh, Claire mentioned a similar concept as well in her presentation, is uh, being able to integrate uh, some uh, uh, live-in mentors in our program as well, and, and that's something that we're looking at too. Excellent. Um, I see some great other questions coming in. I'm going to try to get us through as many as possible in the next uh, six minutes or so. Um, this is voice to Alex. Um, I'm going to guess this is Alex Abramovich, but please feel free both Alex's to answer this question. Um, and that is whether there is a go to LGBT uh, 2S plus um, specific training that you inclusion training that you might recommend. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, I'm assuming that would be for housing sector, uh, people working in the housing sector, for sure. Yeah, so I think that there are some really great options available um, in Canada. And I'm thinking, I mean, I'm I'm located in Toronto, so a lot of the um, community organizations that I tend to work with in, in, in my area, um, you know, it's a little bit more local, but there are definitely, um, depending on where this uh, individuals asking like if they're if it's lo location based um, I think that my response would be quite different like if they're asking from Alberta I would have a different re response if it was maybe um, more of an Ontario based uh, question so on a more local level as to the programs that uh, that uh, Alex and um, and Claire um, who were just responding about um, I would say, you know, my go-to sort of um, place for inclusion training has for a long time been the 519 because I have done a lot of work with the 519 and that's a, uh, a 2S LGBTQ community um, center uh, located in Toronto and they offer a wide range of education and training uh, programs, um, you know, at their facility. And so they have the option to provide virtual training as well as to go into services as well. And so I've done a lot of work with the 519 and I think that they actually do a really great job at offering a um, kind of like a, you know, a, a 2S LGBTQ inclusion training for housing uh, workers. And I know that, you know, here in Toronto, we have the hostel training um, center and they do work with the 519 as well to, to offer that training. I've also worked with the 519 to develop a uh, some training curriculum um, with regards to working with 2S LGBTQ youth, but it also, it really does depend on what type, there's so many different types of training and like there's like the basic training, which may not be enough for people, for example, who are working at Sprout House, you know, they may not need that sort of basic training, they might need something a little bit more intensive. Um, I think it looks like Claire wants to jump in. So I'll let you go ahead, Claire. I did not want to interrupt you, Alex, not at all. Um, I just wanted to add on to that once. Uh, thank you for your amazing list uh, that Away Home Canada also has an LGBTQ youth toolkit. And I was busily trying to find that in the background. So I'm going to try I'm going to hop off and find that so I can post it in the chat for folks. Just as a reminder, thank you, Alex. Yes, that's great. I think, yeah, that, that's that's a really good response. I think that there's the option of having uh, like a, a training center come in and, and work with your staff, for example, or do like a virtual session. And then there's also toolkits. There's a really, really great toolkits that are available online where you can just sort of go at your own pace, work with your team, so I think, um, I think that's actually a wonderful change to, to say that today we have different options, whereas, you know, some years ago, it was like we really didn't have too many options uh, with regards to this type of training. So, um, yeah, and, and if, if, uh, if they would like to follow up with, with any of us, I'm sure that we could direct them to some of these resources. Thank you. Thanks. And you know what, uh, we have just a couple more minutes, a great question from Kelsey, and maybe I'll steer this towards Francesca and Alex Chang. Um, and that is the question of, uh, for different programs, what has been the process? So for your program at Blue Door, what has been the process for finding and bringing participants into the housing? So how do you do your outreach? That's, 
That's a, a very a very interesting question. It's been uh, for us. It's been reaching out through all the avenues that we have to, through social media, through uh, through email blasts, through uh, um, contacting partners, uh, uh, being able to establish uh, partnerships with uh, child protection agencies as well. So it's it's really for us at this uh, point in in uh, in the program is just reaching out as widely as like as we can and really explaining what the criteria for the program is and uh, uh, and for us is is uh, to SLGBTQ youth that are uh, looking to live independently. Francesca, do you want to add to that at all? No, oh, what you said is perfectly uh, correct. Um, I just want to add that at the moment, the majority of our uh, referrals are come from uh, CIS workers or uh, through the gender affirming clinic. Great, well, thank you both so much for that. One very last question, um, and that is in relationship to some of the initiatives that have been proposed. Claire, I believe that this is in relationship to your program. Um, did, did that program get approved for the Rapid Housing Initiative funding, and is it moving forward? We haven't heard yet is the short answer, so we're still waiting to hear. When we recorded the presentation at the end of October, we were expecting to hear sometime in November uh, or into this early December. So fingers crossed, wishes luck, folks. Great. And OK, one more 30 second question, Claire, actually for you as well, um, is whether the new build is going to also be a 2S LGBTQ plus specific. Um, and if you have a proposed staffing model, if you could answer that in about 30 seconds, that would be great. Uh, we're not we're not ready to launch the staffing model uh, plan yet, but um, it will be to us LGBTQ plus exclusive yet, which is very exciting. Excellent. It's all quite fresh news actually. So literally, as we we're presenting, it's like, ooh, this is exciting. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> we'll let you know. We'll keep you posted. Great. Well, I'll wrap us up there and thank our speakers so much. What an interesting and exciting panel. Um, and we look forward to seeing a lot more from all of you in the future. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.